Okay, uh, Romans, we're in chapter 14, and I want to, you know how I always do, pick back up and give you a little bit about where we are. As I, as I said last week, there's a conflict between the Jewish and the Gentile Christians in Rome stemming from the, the Jewish Christians' hyperactive consciences with regard to eating meat and observing certain holy days. Now, the Jews had been trained all their lives. They'd been raised this way. They had been trained that observance of the Old Covenant's dietary laws and holy days, that these were matters of great importance to God. So when, when they became Christians, it was difficult for some of them to accept in their hearts, see, to really feel inside, beyond the words, to really accept in their hearts that these things were now a matter of indifference to God. They just, that, that, it troubled their consciences. They really felt like at some level these things were uh, something that mattered to God. And unlike the Judaizers, and I think this is an important thing to grasp, unlike the Judaizers, the Jewish Christians in Rome, they didn't claim that the Gentile Christians had to obey the Mosaic law to be saved. Because if they had done that, then you could expect that Paul would have responded similarly as he did to, to Judaizers everywhere. He says, no, we're having none of that. But that's not what was going on here. See, rather they observed dietary laws and holy days as a matter of personal conscience. But even here you can imagine there, there's a tendency to think that those who weren't following the Mosaic law, that they really were less faithful. You know, they weren't quite into it enough you see that they were really compromising to be easy and you can see how that would be in holding those folks somewhat at a, at a distance and then on the other side you'd have the gentile christians those who were not following the mosaic law with regard to the food laws and the holy days they'd look down on those who were as unenlightened you know these look at these people they don't get it and also is arrogant because it's like they think they're really the spiritual ones. And so you can see how this would produce within a community of believers some tension. Now Romans 14, 1 through chapter 15, verse 13, it's a plea for peace among the Jewish and Gentile Christians in Rome. And we're looking at 14, 1 to 12, and we got through the first six verses, and I won't uh, read it again, but let me just remind you of, of some of the, what I said about the first six verses. In those verses, Paul, he tells the, the Gentile majority that they're to welcome and to receive the one who's weak in faith, meaning the Jewish Christians. The Jewish Christian who's weak in his grasp of the implications of the faith. The Jewish Christians who, ha who has underdeveloped convictions about what the faith allows. Weak in that sense, and Paul says that those whose faith is strong enough to eat meat, the Gentile believers, those who understand the liberty that they have from the Mosaic law in Christ, he says that they're not to have a disdainful or condescending attitude toward the law-observing Jewish minority, but neither is the Jewish minority to judge those who eat meat, he says, because God's welcomed them. So you're not to judge them, or you're not to condemn them. And since God accepts them, the, uh, the Jewish Christians have to accept them. That's what Paul says there. So not observing the food laws or holy days, or observing the food, either whether not observing them or observing them, uh, these things both were acceptable to God because neither is sinful. And I went through that last week. See, the one who observes holy days and the one who abstains from meat uh, and wine that they think could be ceremonially tainted, uh, they're wrong about that. You see, they think that, that God cares about this. But the one who does that, who, who abstains from that because he uh, believes, albeit erroneously, that it's God's will that they abstain from it, uh, that person's not sinning because that person is doing more than the Lord requires. That person is restricting his freedom. Okay, so neither one of these is sinful. And the one who correctly understands that the ritual or ceremonial aspects of the law, the food laws, that they're not binding on Christians, that person is simply enjoying his liberty in Christ. Okay, so now, in, in 14, 
uh, of course, these observant Jews now, you have to understand that, that, that they believe that at some level this is a matter of God's will. That's what's troubling their consciences. Somewhere down deep at some level they think, nah, I just don't feel right about doing that. God wouldn't have me do that. You see, even though somebody can say them, as Paul writes to them, it's this training that they've had. They've been so socialized into the importance of this that they can't, uh, you know, live that way without violating their consciences. Okay, that's in the, f- the first six verses. Maybe I'll hold Andrew here for a second. Now, Paul's suggestion here, let me make sure I'm in the right, the right place. Yeah, okay. Paul's suggestion that the observance of holy days is a matter of indifference to God. That raises a number of questions for us. Is Paul denying that Sunday is an appointed day for Christians to gather for corporate worship? I don't think so. You see, I don't think that's what Paul is saying. After all, Sunday is called the Lord's Day. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, which shows it's somehow distinctive from other days. I mean, it's referred to as the Lord's Day. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, we see that Paul, he told both the Galatian churches and the Corinthians to set aside a sum of money. He tells them to set aside a sum of of money for the collection of the poor saints in Jerusalem on the first day of each week. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we see that the saints gathered on the first day of the week specifically to observe the Lord's Supper, to break bread. And so I don't think that's what Paul is saying. What I think he's saying is that under the new covenant, the Jewish practice of considering certain days distinctively holy, see, that's important, distinctively holy is a matter of indifference to God. No day is holier than another for those who are in Christ. Rather, all days are equally holy, so Christians aren't obligated to, to observe the Sabbath or other holy days. The same truth you see is you, you see that in Galatians chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. You see it in Colossians chapter 2, 16 and 17. And that means, by the way, that those who seek to bind Sabbath observance on Christians are wrong. And there are groups that do that. But those who seek to do that are wrong, and if they're making it a test of salvation, they're lost. Okay, now... That, that the Lord's Day is an appointed day, is an appointed day of Christian worship, doesn't mean that it's a, a more sacred day in the sense that the Sabbath was considered a sacred and holy day. Now, I realize that some people look at the Lord's Day, they look at Sunday as a kind of Christianized Sabbath. Okay, you, you see that, and that's a thread of Christian theology that looks at the, as Sunday as a Christianized Sabbath. And I don't think that's the right way to understand what Sunday is. Sunday is the Lord's Day. It is a day of gathering as the day of Christ's resurrection. It is not a distinctively holy day in the sense the Sabbath was. Let me read just this quote from Andrew Lincoln. He's a New Testament scholar. This is from his chapter uh, from Sabbath to Lord's Day in a book by that title. He says, the Lord's Day need not be considered in terms of a sacred day. Now, all of this isn't Paul's concern. I'm I'm going into this because this is often our concern when we read something like that, okay? The Lord's Day need not be understood in terms of a sacred day. The day can be said to be the Lord's because it's the appropriate day for worshiping Him. And this is significantly, with no hyphen, hmm, significantly different from the view that sees the day by analogy with the Jewish Sabbath as a full 24-hour period belonging to the Lord in a distinct way from that in which all the Christian's time belongs to the Lord. Whereas the latter is in conflict with the sentiment approved in Romans 14.5, the former by no means, the former need by no means be. So this idea of saying, no, the, the, the Sunday is, a, is the analog of the Jewish Sabbath, Well, it seems to me that conflicts with what Paul is talking about here. If you look at the Sabbath in terms, no, it's the Lord's day. It's not distinctively holy in the sense the Sabbath was, but it's the day for gathering for worship. You see, that's that's an important thing, I think. He says, there's a sense in which all of life should be a prayer, and yet a recognition of this does not detract from this need for specific prayer at specific times. Similarly, the notion that all of one's time is devoted to the Lord, 
does not detract from the necessity of specific worship at specific times, to claim that specifically Sunday is the appropriate day for a gathering of the Christian community for worship is not to imply that somehow in itself that day is holy. So I think that, I think that distinction between the sacredness of the day and the Sabbath, and you know, this affects how we do things. I think that this is probably behind, you know, worshiping, ha- having two worship services on Sunday. I mean, I, that, that's just a standard, not only in churches of Christ, but that's a norm, and it's partly the idea that we do this because the whole day is devoted over to the Lord. You know, you're supposed to rest and focus and all that kind of thing. Okay, so I think some of this theology comes into uh, our practices, and I have no problem with twice a day. I mean, I've done it many times, uh, but I'm just saying I think the theology feeds into that. So, first question is that comes up normally when you're reading this, well, is Paul then saying that there's nothing distinctive about the Lord's Day so that in gathering on the Lord's Day, that's neither here nor there. We can gather on Thursday, we gather on Friday, blah, 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 okay? Uh, I think there's something about, and you know, we can gather, and obviously, and sing and have praise and that kind of thing. We gather together to take the Lord's Supper and communal worship on the Lord's Day, okay? So I think that's one of the things that's, that's an important thing. Uh, now, secondly, the thing that comes up is Paul saying that Christians are free to make up their own holy days and observe them. All right? I mean, that's a question that, that comes up. At least it comes up to me. Well, it, is that okay? Well, I don't think that's okay. The holy days that Paul is speaking about here, they were prescribed by God in the Old Testament. You see, those, the Sabbath and these other holy days, they were prescribed. It's one thing for the Jew who'd been trained in the law all his life to feel that observing these days was an honor to God. It's another thing to feel that days not appointed, days not sanctioned by God can be observed and honored him. For me to just make something up with no indication from God that these are days that... So here's the Jew. The Jew is caught... He's caught in the salvation historical shift brought by Christ. That makes it a distinct situation, a unique situation. Because here we have the old covenant where they've been brought up. God has commanded these things, Sabbath and these these holy days. And they're brought up all the time. Now here comes Christ and that covenant is obsolete and they're in the shift. You see, they're in the shift. And I think that distinguishes their situation from somebody who comes up and says, hey, like, you know, uh, Seinfeld, I want to have Festivus. I'm just going to create a holy day. And do I think Paul saying that would be okay? I don't think Paul is saying that would be okay. Okay, I don't think Paul is saying that, that at all. Now, what about Jewish converts today? You see, would their observance of holy days and food laws, would that still be a matter of indifference to God? You know, it may be that more is expected in light of the completed revelation. You see, right, we, have, we now have the entire New Testament, the canon, and we have more in there. So maybe more is expected in light of the completed revelation, and I would certainly try to teach them. But maybe, you see, maybe they, they could have the same hyperactive consciences as Jews of Paul's day. But whether, whether that's the case or not, They have to be careful in any event. They have to be careful, you see, not to bind their weak conscience on other believers. And they must not adopt elements of the law that are inherently contrary to the gospel. Like if they're here offering sacrifices. You see, we're going to have a sacrifice for sin. (laughs) See, we can't have that. You see, even if, even if you said, yes, I, I think, yes, there is complete revelation now. More is expected of them. But maybe their conscience can be analogous to what's happening here. Okay, so food laws and holy days. Uh, okay, you see, there's a difference between that and some other things. All right. Those are like one big footnote. <laughs> because, you know, I don't think that those are just issues that come up that I like to talk about when I'm on this, on this particular thing. Uh, but in verses 7 to 9. Paul says that the Christian must follow his conscience, as I said last week, and he's going to say it again. The Christian must follow his conscience because he or she lives to please the Lord, not his fellow believers. Right? I mean, you and I serve the Lord, and we have to do what we understand the Lord wants us to do. You see, that's important. We're the Lord's, he says, from start to finish. 
Every aspect of our lives, even our death, is lived under his lordship. Everything. Christ's lordship is so total that it includes both the dead and the living. So he's the absolute Lord. And that's the one, that's who we serve, the absolute Lord. So our conscience is something that we have to follow because we live to please him, not to please you. So if I'm convinced that's what he wants me to do, well, that's, that's it. You see, in these matters of indifference. So he's talking about these Jews who are convinced there's something not right about that. you got to go with that. You have, to, you have to go with that. Then verses 10 to 12. In 10 to 12, he explains that refusing to accept one another because of disputes over matters of indifference, the things that are indifferent to God, that it's absurd. In light of the fact that we're each going to answer to God not only for our practices, but also for our refusal to receive one another. So he's telling, see, the Jew, Jews and Gentiles here in Rome, he's saying, look, you guys... Don't let this thing become something. You have to accept and receive one another and get along and love each other because you're going to stand before God not only for your practices but also how you received each other. And there are times, I think, in fact, that I I read things in the Bible and I wonder, is God doing something here and caring more about how we treat each other in our disagreement? Is that what he's doing? You see, that that's part of how we are to be as disciples is how we're to learn to get along in some of these areas of, you know, matters of indifference to God. All right, 13 to 23. Now, that was, I, I decided not to read that because I read it last week, so I hope that enough of it was in your head that when I was throwing these things up and talking that uh, you could follow what I was trying to get at. All right, 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 13 to 23. He says, Let us therefore no longer judge one another... But judge, decide, make up your mind this instead. Not to place a stumbling block for a brother or a cause for offense. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Except to the one who considers something to be unclean. To that one, it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved on account of your food, you no longer are walking in accordance with love. Do not by your food destroy that one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be blasphemed. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For the one who in this serves Christ as a slave, is pleasing to God and approved by people. So then, let us pursue the things of peace and the things of edification for one another. Do not, for the sake of food, demolish the work of God. All things are indeed clean. But it is evil for the person who eats with stumbling to eat. The one who thinks it's not clean. You see, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, keep to yourself before God. Blessed is the man who does not bring judgment on himself by what he approves, but the man who doubts stands condemned if he eats because it is not from faith. And everything that is not from faith is sin. Okay, Paul says in verse 13, he tells the Jewish and Gentile Christians, he tells them that rather than than judge each other, they ought to decide, they ought to make up their mind not to place before a brother or sister a stumbling block, a spiritual trap, a cause for offense. In other words, we are not to do something that will lead to the spiritual downfall of of a brother or sister, and it becomes clear in the following verses that Paul is specifically speaking about the differences between Jewish and Gentile Christians regarding the Old Covenant food laws. That's what he's talking about. And in verse 14, verse 14, it's somewhat of a parenthetical in that it gives the basis on which one's behavior uh, can be a stumbling block and an obstacle. 
It gives the basis on which one can lead to a, one's behavior can lead to another's spiritual harm. See, the fact of the matter, Paul says, is that no food is unclean. That's the objective fact of the matter. That's the truth of the matter. The ritual defilements of the Mosaic law are no longer operative. So Paul sits here and he says, look, no food is unclean, meaning ritually defiled as defined in the Mosaic law. Those aspects of the law have no continuing validity. Indeed, the Lord himself taught that. In Mark chapter 7, verse 19, the second part, you remember he declared all foods clean? So Paul says the objective truth of the matter is that no food's unclean, but that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. It's like, okay, everything's clean, that's fine. What it means to you, I don't care. That's not the end of the story. The Jewish Christians whom Paul labels weak in the faith, in the sense I've talked about, they have underdeveloped convictions about what the faith allows. See, these Jewish Christians that he labels weak in the faith, they haven't been able to internalize that truth. You see, they haven't been able to escape the sense that this is not right. So this is something because of their upbringing, their consciences have been so firmly trained regarding the Mosaic food laws that they cannot escape the sense that it's wrong to eat meat or to drink wine that may be ritually contaminated. They, just, they feel this is something that's wrong, and because of that personal conviction, they would be sinning if they consume that kind of food or drink. They think it's wrong. Paul says, I know it's not wrong. But he says, these guys over here haven't been able to liberate their inner man. So when they do it thinking it's wrong, they sin because they are violating their conscience They are doing something they think is wrong. And so he says, says, look, when that winds up happening, if you believe God forbids you to do something, see, you're doing it, as I said last week, it dishonors God because it says that you value the thing you're doing more than God. You think God doesn't want you to do it. But you say, I'm going to do it anyway. Why? Because I want Joe to to think I'm cool. I want Joe to think I'm broad-minded. I want Joe to not think I'm a nitwit. So I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Well, who do you serve? Do you serve Joe or do you serve the Lord? See, that's, that's the idea of what he's talking about. In verses 15 and 16, make sure I'm... All right, in 15 and 16, he explains the, the second part of 13, decide not to place a stumbling block for a brother. Okay, you've got that. Don't place a stumbling block. He, in, in 15, he explains 13 in light of what he said in 14, where he says, violating one's conscience is sinful. Don't place a stumbling block. How, how could that happen? Violating one's conscience is sinful. That gives the basis for it. And then in 15, he goes back and connects with verse 13, and he says to the Gentile majority that certain ways of exercising their right to eat meat and to drink wine may lead a Jewish brother or sister into sin by pressuring them to act contrary to their albeit hyperactive conscience. And that would be inconsistent with the cardinal Christian virtue of love. If I'm willing to do that, knowing that I'm going to risk pressuring you to act ahead of your conscience and therefore sin, am I acting lovingly toward you? No, because love is a sacrificial commitment to your welfare. So if I'm sitting here saying, listen, I don't care about you. You don't get it, and I frankly don't care what effect my doing this is going to have on you. I don't care. Well, that's not loving. (laughs) That's not loving. And that's what Paul is saying here, you see. He goes further and he commands them not to exercise their freedom to eat in such a way that it will destroy the weaker Jewish brethren for whom Christ died. You say they are not to let their good liberty, it is good, but they are not to let their good liberty be reviled. They're not to let it be blasphemed, which is what would happen if they exercised it without regard to the tender consciences of their brothers. 
What would that then do? The brothers who are getting steamrolled by that would revile them for it. So this is what he means there, see, that they're not to let their good be blasphemed. Let me read to you a couple of commentators. Uh, here's C.E.B. Cranfield. He says, the gar, it's a Greek preposition, for, of, of verse 15, connects this sentence not with 14, but with 13b, the second part of 13. The weak in faith will be grievously hurt. He will have the integrity of his faith, faith in the deepest sense of Fides qua, this is, I had to look this up. It's this idea of, you know, the subjective sense of faith, not the content of the faith, the objective. It is the subjective conviction. So he's going to be hurt in the deepest sense of this and obedience destroyed and his salvation put at risk if he is led by his strong fellow Christians' insistence on exercising the liberty which the strong Christian truly has. Right? I mean, he's in the right on the matter. We know that because Paul, by the Spirit, is telling us that. But he says here, his salvation put at risk if he's led by his strong fellow Christians' insistence on exercising the liberty, which the strong Christians truly has, into doing something for which he as yet does not possess the inward liberty. The strong will therefore not be acting in accordance with Christian love if his weak brother is thus seriously hurt on account of the food which he, the strong Christian, eats. You see Douglas Moo in his commentary. He says, verse 14, supplying the theoretical basis for Paul's use of the language of spiritual downfall. This is this explanation that if you violate your conscience, you're sinning. He says, supplying the theoretical basis for Paul's use of the language of spiritual downfall in verse 13 is somewhat parenthetical. Verse 15 accordingly probably relates back especially to verse 13. Don't put a stumbling block in the way of your brother for this is what you're doing. By insisting on exercising your freedom to eat food, you bring pain to your fellow believer and thereby violate the cardinal Christian virtue of love. The pain that the strong believer causes the weak believer is more than the annoyance or irritation that the weak believer might feel toward those who act in ways they do not approve. Now this is a big point, and this is why I think we have tended to neglect this teaching. We are so afraid that a crank is going to run roughshod over the congregation that we just ignore it. But you can't ignore what Paul is saying about this. You see, so it's a matter of conviction and conscience. It's not, I like beige walls, you like green ones. I like having three songs, you like five. We're not talking about that. You see, we're not talking about that. He says it's relationship to the warnings about spiritual downfall. In verses 13b and 15b show that it must, be, that it must denote the pain caused the weak believer by the violation of his or her conscience. This is not a trivial thing. Now, we mock it sometimes and laugh at it, but you cause somebody to violate their conscience, you are harming their spirit. That's serious business. Okay, it's something very, very, very uh, important. And so Paul is saying to them, listen, you cannot be doing this because that's contrary to love. And then he explains in verses in 17 and 18. He explains that the kingdom of God in which we participate, that it's not essentially a matter of eating and drinking. He says, how can you want to stand on eating and drinking and destroy your brothers? Is you think that's what the kingdom of God is about? Do you think it's about your liberty to eat and drink? So he says, listen, it's not about that. See, the kingdom is a matter of righteousness and peace and joy that are produced by the Holy Spirit. And I think he's talking about righteousness, moral living that is produced by the Holy Spirit. Support of and harmony with fellow believers. Peace that is produced by the Holy Spirit. And joy in the life and fellowship with which God has blessed us that is produced by the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom is about. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, the one who serves, he says, see, the one who serves, the one who in this, the one who in this serves Christ as a slave is pleasing to God and approved by people. 
You see, the one who serves Christ with those priorities on straight is pleasing to God, and rather than being blasphemed or reviled by the weak, he is esteemed by them. He's approved by them. Your weak brother, who you in love, you abstain from something because you love the person and don't want to push him ahead of his conscience, his response is gratitude and love and appreciation. Knowing that you feel differently about it, but knowing that you care enough for him that you're willing to restrain your liberty because you love him. And you see, what does that do? That builds. It's the person, I don't care what you're doing. You're a pinhead. You're a narrow-minded pinhead, and I don't care about you. Well, what does that do to the church? It fragments the church, and it causes people to revile them. And that's not good. It's not good. Okay, Paul says in verse 19, he exhorts them to pursue peace and mutual edification. As Cranfield says in his commentary, what is required is an altogether earnest seeking to promote among brethren such a true peace as must manifest itself in mutual upbuilding. Now, this applies to all. I understand that. This applies to all, but the strong especially needed to hear this because of their insensitive treatment of the weak. They were running roughshod, or there was the risk of them running roughshod over the, over the sensitive consciences of the weak because of their liberty. They say, listen, that's, I'm going to do what I have a liberty to do. And Paul says, yes, that's true, you have the liberty, but that's not the end of the story, that as Christians we are lovers. We are committed to each other and committed to one another's welfare. In, ver in verses uh, 20 to the first part of 22, Paul then he rephrases the same points that he made in verses 13 to 15. The believer should not eat meat, drink wine, or do anything else when to do so will harm his brothers or sisters by pushing them to act ahead of their conscience. He should restrict his liberty out of love for his brothers and sisters. We hate that. We hate that. But there it is. That's what Paul is saying. I'm convinced as sure as I'm sitting here or standing here. You see, he says that the strong shouldn't exercise their conviction in their weak brothers' faces. In their weak brothers' faces, you see, thereby putting a stumbling block in their path, but they should abstain in those situations. That's what he means in verse 22 when he says, to keep the convictions, to keep the faith you have to yourself before God. You see, you're not to exercise your liberty in the face of your brothers when to do so will push them ahead of their consciences. You are in those situations to abstain out of love for them. You keep that between, you know, you keep that conviction that you have to yourself before God. Now, since Paul clearly stated, and he says elsewhere, that all food is clean, he obviously is not forbidding all teaching. You see, there's something about practicing something in the presence of another person that apparently has an increased likelihood of pushing them ahead of their conscience. So Paul is teaching them here, but that's not what he's talking about. He said you abstain in those circumstances where you run the risk, you don't do these things in your weak brother's faces. He's restricting their exercise of liberty uh, with the until the weak have genuinely been, genuinely been enlightened. Okay, now you see why this is difficult for us. We don't like this because we think this makes church too difficult and again, it makes us hostage to narrow conscience people. But I say again, one of the things is it's conscience. Okay, you say, well, you know, people can wind up fabricating matters of conscience out of everything. Okay, well, this is part of the difficulty of being an elder is that one has to sit here and say, is this bona fide, legitimate matter of conscience, or is this cover for preference? Okay, a guy says, well, I think the wall ought to be green. He said, I don't you know, if other people don't, so what can I tell you? Sorry, we're going beige. And he said, well, no, uh, you're offending my conscience. 
So you have to say, well, okay, you're going to have to walk me through the biblical case for that. Okay, so that's what you do. You go say, okay, go ahead, let me, let me hear this. Now, if somebody has something eccentric, somebody has something novel, somebody has something bizarre, well, that's a clue. That's a clue that they're substituting preference for conscience, and they're trying to cover it. Okay, are all the cases going to be crystal clear, bright lines? No, but life is not like that, right? I'm giving you categories and concepts that I think are right. And the application as you get to the edge, I can imagine some fuzzy things, but that's why elders make the big money. <laughs> you see? And that's also, by the way, why it's such a responsibility and why we are to respect them and love them and encourage them. Because this stuff's not easy. You see, this is not easy, and this is spiritual life, and it can get very difficult. Okay, let me, let me hear in the uh, second part of 22, 22B, trying to watch that clock. Oh, I'm going to run out. All right, 22B and 23. Paul says, blessed is the strong believer whose conscience doesn't condemn him when he exercises his liberty. In other words, somebody like Paul, Paul says, I'm blessed because I can practice the liberty God has given me without my conscience being bothered. See, that person is blessed, but the weak believer who eats with doubts about its propriety, that person is sinning and is therefore under God's condemnation. Let me real quickly here. Uh, 15, 1 to 6, I'll at least read it and get as far as I can. He says, now we the strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those who are not strong and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor in what is good for the purpose of edification. For even the Christ did not please himself, but just as it is written, the insults of those who insult you fell on me. For as much as was written beforehand was written for our instruction in order that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might hold hope securely. And may the God of endurance and encouragement give you a like mind among yourselves in accordance with Christ Jesus so that unanimously with one mouth, that was the first bell, right? Ah. unanimously with one mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ together, one, in unity as one people, one mouth he even says that together you may glorify uh, our Lord Jesus Christ All right, rather than the strong pleasing themselves by insisting on the unfettered exercise of their liberty they ought to bear the weaknesses of the weak meaning that they ought to ease the burden of the weak by accepting them and doing what love requires toward them. That's what he means when he says, ought to bear the weaknesses of those who are not strong. We receive them in their weakness, and we act lovingly toward them. We don't run roughshod over their weak conscience. Each of the strong should please his weak neighbor, meaning his weak brother, his weak fellow believer, for the neighbor's spiritual benefit which results in growth and solidarity, edification of the community of faith. This is the consequence. Now, we want to argue with this. Say, no, no, that's not the consequence. If I abstain and I give them a little rope, they'll go crazy. So we ignore this teaching. And he says that in doing that, you harm the body of Christ. Because by living this way, Hey, look, by living this way, you see you wind up contributing. It results in the growth and the solidarity and the edification. Now, does God know or do we know? You see, that happens a lot of times, like with disfellowshipping. Well, I don't want to do that. It's unloving. Does God know what's loving or do we know? So we have, we're going to defer to God. You see, we're going to let God choose. We're going to let God decide how this works. See, and then he says, for even Christ, you know, see, each of the strong, they should please the weak. Okay, they should do that. They, they should seek to please the weak for the neighbor's spiritual benefit. He says, for even the Christ didn't please himself, but he went to the cross where he bore for others the ultimate insults against God. Let me read to you what Cranfield says. He says, the purpose of the quotation of Psalm 69.9 9, is to indicate the length to which Christ went in his not pleasing himself. Can you see talking to people saying, I, I want to eat. I got a right to eat and I'm going to eat it. 
He said, don't you care what it's going to do? I don't care. They're wrong. What do I care about them? They're wrong. They need to get over it. Lump it. Pinheads anyway. Can't understand anything. Well, is that how Christ did it? He says, Cranfield says, it's to indicate the lengths to which Christ went in his not pleasing himself. If he, for men's sakes, was willing to bear as one element of his sufferings the concentration of all men's hatred of God, of all their futile, inanely contemptuous insolence against God, how absurdly ungrateful should we be if we could not bring ourselves to renounce our self-gratification in so unimportant a matter as the exercising of our freedom with regard to what we eat or whether we observe special days for the sake of our brothers for whom he suffered so much. Now see, that puts, to me, that puts our relationship in a different context. You see, if you can't do it out of love for your brother, so you do it out of love for the Lord Jesus Christ who died for that brother or sister. And here you are going, I don't really care. I'm going to steamroll him because he's an ignoramus. You see, well, you love him. You love him, and that's what Paul's saying here. You see, now having quoted Psalm 69, Paul then in verse 4, he quotes the text and then he reminds us that the scriptures were written for their instruction, meaning for our instruction also. You see, so that, so, so that with endurance and by means of the encouragement provided by the Scriptures, they might remain steadfast in their hope. See, though written in the past, all of God's Word is God's Word for us today. And we draw from that. that, is where, that is where we, that's what sets our view of life in the world. That's part of what the world hates. It's because I believe the Bible is God speaking to me. And so I take that from God and I listen and I heed what he says. All right, verses 5 and 6, they contain a prayer for intercession that Paul offers to God. And he records this prayer for the benefit of the Roman Christians. It kind of serves as an indirect way of exhorting them. His prayer is that they may have a like mind. Give me just a second because I'm almost finished this section. All right, he says, all right, he says that, they, that they may have a like mind among themselves. A like mind among themselves, see, meaning that despite their differences over food laws and holy days, they might remain united in their devotion to the Lord and to serving Him in the world. So he's, he's saying, listen, like-minded, you see, only when that kind of unity exists, that kind of peace within the fellowship, are they able to glorify God in a way that He deserves to be glorified. Division over matters of indifference diverts the church from its purpose. It's no small potatoes, okay, to wrangle and quarrel and divide over the matters of indifference. All right, I heard the bell. I'm through. Thank you. <laughs>